The past several weeks we've been exploring uh, the book of James. James was sharing some thoughts with fellow believers about how to live out faith. And James encourages uh, the believers to put their faith in action. Uh, what it looks like to do that well, how to do that wisely. And that's really what we've talked about this year. We've, that this is a year and it's time. It's a season where we need to start putting our faith in action. It's not enough just to say we have it, but we've got to do it. And he describes the wisdom that comes to us from God, the qualities that the wisdom of God has, so that the people can recognize what wise living looks like, separate from foolish living, that if you want to live according to God, you need to live wisely. So in chapter 3, James says this, and we read this every week, he says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure, it is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, you know we're going through this, so you know you can like just look ahead and it'll show you what we're talking about each week. So you can kind of get ahead of us here. And each of the past few weeks, we've zeroed in on one of these qualities. And this week, it says the wisdom of God is willing to yield to others. How many of you are excited for this message right now? Willing to yield to others. When you're in a moment of decision, you have a choice in front of you, how to respond, what to do. Anytime you find yourself in a moment of decision, somebody says something, something happens in your life, you're faced with a decision. How do you handle yourself? The wise way that God will prompt you to live indicates that it'll look like a willingness to yield to others. Yes. All right. Now, I can't imagine where in the world we would ever struggle with that. Surely none of you would ever not be willing to yield to somebody. Like there's never a moment, right, where you'd be like, ah, you know, some of you are already like, I'm done. Why? Man, two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. These messages are lousy. I'm not coming back for more of this. I, here's the deal. I, I, I know why perhaps willing to yield. Maybe we struggle with that. And there's it's because there's two types of people in this world. It has nothing to do with Neil Diamond. Okay, two types of people in this world. There are those who th see things the right way, like you do, and then there are those who don't. Right, two types of people. Those who see things the right way, just like you do, and then there's everybody else. Right, that's it, two types of people. When we, when we hear willing to yield, some immediately think willing to yield to those who are wrong. Did any of you, that's what you thought. Willing to yield, that means it must indicate that I'm willing to yield to those who are wrong. That's what, that's what God is asking me to do. He's asking me to submit myself to fools and idiots. That's what God is asking of me, and we're not interested in doing that. Um, it can be very easy to equate willing to yield with willing to be wrong, or willing to be misled, or willing to be fooled, or willing to be deceived, right? That's what we hear when we think willing to yield. Well, yield to who? Because there's a lot of people I'm not willing to yield to because I know what kind of person they are. And I'm not interested in yielding to that kind of person because that doesn't sound like wisdom to me. So God, what's the deal? What are you telling me here? When we hear the term yield, we can think weakness, foolishness. But here's the thing. Every quality in this list that comes from God, it reflects God's own nature. So go with me for a minute here. Right? There is nothing that God is that we should not desire. Right? Is there any quality in God that we would go, ah, I don't want that? There shouldn't be any quality of God that we say we don't need, we don't want, it's not good for us. Okay? So, if the wisdom from above is pure, that's because God is pure. And if the wisdom from above is peace-loving, it's because God is peace-loving. And if the wisdom from above is gentle at all times, it's because God is Gentle at all times. So if the wisdom from above is willing to yield to others, what does that mean God is? Wait, what? Are you, Pastor Dan, are you telling me God is willing to yield to others? Because this starts to step into some theological waters that we're not sure we're ready to go. It means we might need to dig a little deeper because the God I know, um, he, he doesn't change right? He can't change. So how can God possibly be willing to yield to others, and what does it mean for us if he is? 
Is God truly willing to yield to others? Are we reading this right? Maybe, maybe we're off in the Greek, right? The phrase willing to yield to others comes from one Greek word, a single Greek word. And that word is irrelevant because none of you speak Koine Greek, so I'm not going to tell you what that word is. I could make up a word. You'd be like, oh, okay. Nobody knows. Nobody cares what the Greek word is. But here's what you need to know. It's one word. It's one word that we translate willing to yield to others. That's five words. That's five words we're using to translate one word. Because sometimes there's not a straight equivalent word in English from the Greek. There's so much more texture. There's so much more context to the Greek words. And when we say it in English, it's like, uh, I mean, willing to yield to others is our version of one word. And so translators use a variety of words to try to capture what the original authors, what those authors meant. Here's the thing about this particular word. It's only found one time in the entire Bible. This is the only time you're ever going to hear this is this one time. And translators use several different words. It comes from a compound of a, of a word. So there's two parts of this word. There's like a, there's two components. The first meaning like well, as in like well done or good or good job done, right? And then the second word meaning persuaded. So it means well persuaded or, or goodly persuaded. It's, it's doesn't, again, English, right? It doesn't really work. So you could translate it well persuaded. The NIV uses this word. They use the word um, considerate. So this, we're in the New Living Translation. The, the Bible that you have is a translation. That's, it's called the New Living Translation, and it's what we use in the church, but it doesn't mean it's, it's perfect. It's just a bunch of people's attempt to try and take the Greek and make it make sense today in a language that we can understand. I find it to be very readable. For the most part, it's pretty good, so we use it. Okay? It says willing to yield to others. It means kind of well persuaded. The NIV says the word just considerate. The wisdom from above is considerate. The, the English Standard Version would say it's it's open to reason. The wisdom from above is open to reason. The New American Standard Bible, which is the most literal translation, it says it's reasonable. So they're kind of building a thing. And the reason, uh, you know, sometimes defining the opposite is also helpful. Yes, right? So that would be like stubborn, a refusal to listen, right? Stiff-necked. How many of you use that all the time? You know, that's such a common phrase. You know, oh, my stiff-necked coworker, right? We just, I mean, if you have a stiff neck, it's something else, right? You go to a chiropractor, but, right? Do you know anybody stubborn, refuses to listen, unreasonable? Don't point, don't point, right? But do you know of anybody like that, right? I share all of this to help us get more complete idea of what James meant, because it's important for us to understand what is going on here. Willing to yield in the sense of being reasonable. Of being willing to consider. Of being willing to be pers persuaded. That's the heart behind this phrase. So here's the question. What does that mean about God? If that's the intent, that what we're saying here is that the wisdom from above is willing to yield. It's willing to be considerate. It's willing to be open to reason. It's reasonable that it's not stubborn, it's, it's not hard-hearted, it's not stiff-necked, all right? What does that mean about God? Are we saying that we have the power to change God's mind? Is that what we're implying here? And so here, I'm just going to go on a little biblical journey, if you'll come with me. The first verse that comes to mind is Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, and you may know some of these verses. God is not a man, so he does not lie, he is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Okay, there you go. Just right there. God does not change his mind. In 1 Samuel 15, 29, he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he, has changed, that he would change his mind. See, we're human, we change our minds, yes? How many of you have changed your mind in the last 20 minutes? In the last five minutes. Since I started talking, you've changed your mind. All right? We've changed our mind all the time. God does not change his mind. Hebrews 6.16. Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves and hold to, hold to it. Without question, that oath is binding. God has bound himself with an oath so that those who receive the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Pretty clear. It's in the scriptures. God doesn't change his mind. So if God won't change his mind, how can he be willing to yield? How can he be reasonable? How can he be considerate? It doesn't make sense. So I'm going to read a few more scriptures here. Deuteronomy chapter 32, 
Verse 36 says, Indeed, the Lord will give justice to his people, and he will change his mind about his servants when he sees their strength is gone and no one is left. Jeremiah 26, 22. This is what the Lord says. God is saying this to the prophet Jeremiah. Stand in the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord, make an announcement to the people who have come there to worship from all over Judah, and give them my entire message. Include every word. Perhaps then they will listen and turn from their evil ways. Then I will change my mind about the disaster I am ready to pour out on them because of their sins. Screech, hold up, what? Jonah, chapter 3. Jonah goes to Nineveh, doesn't want to go. God sends him, gets eaten by a fish. We know the whole big story. Spits out. Jonah finally gets to Nineveh. He shares this message with people. Hey, you guys are going the wrong way. God doesn't want you to go the wrong way. He's going to crush you all and squish you like a bug. Okay, this is great. He says it to all, and the king says to his nobles and everybody, everybody, we need to, re- re- we need to stop. We need to stop being evil. Then he says this, who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us if we do what is right. So when God saw that the people had done that and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. So here's the question. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Seems like it. God will never change his mind. I might change my mind. I did change my mind. I will never change my mind. Yes, I did. So I would like some of you to come up here and preach this message because I'm done. Okay. Um, We have to identify three things, right? Is this a contradiction? Is this a paradox? Is this the mystery? A contradiction, if you remember, is opposing statements that can't possibly be true. It's a contradiction. Doesn't work. Can't work. It breaks down. Can't work. Paradox means two things that seem on the surface that they don't agree, can't work, but after further exploration and discovery, then you go, ah, it makes sense. A mystery means you can look all you want, you're never going to figure it out. Just don't know. We go, don't know. It's a mystery. Contradiction, clearly can't be. Paradox, doesn't look like it can be, but after further exploration, yeah, it works out. Mystery, we're never going to know. Which one of these is this? Fortunately, I think this is a paradox. We just need to dig a little deeper. We just need to explore a little more. See, the character of God is immutable, right? That's a word we use, and it's a theological term. It means God cannot change who he is. Who he is doesn't change. He is loving. He is true. He is pure. He is powerful. He is good. He is all-knowing, right? He's omnipresent. God cannot violate who he is. That can't change. He never changes, means he can't change, and he can't change his mind about what is right and what is wrong. Those things will forever be true. Right is right, wrong is wrong. God doesn't change about those things. He does not call pure what is impure. He can't do those things. God says, this is who I am. Yet, God is willing to yield to others, and he is reasonable, which means he is not stubborn, he is not obstinate. To be reasonable, what does that mean? It means he is able to reason. That's what it means to be reasonable, to be able to reason. He has not made up his mind on all things. He has said sin will always lead to death. Yet for those who accept salvation, he will not have abandon them, but rather welcome them in, them, them in. See, God says this is the case. This is always the case. Sin always leads to death. I do not change on that. Yet I'm reasonable. If you change... I will see you differently if you accept this. God is reasonable. Just because you were a certain way and his mind is made up about sin, if you change, God is willing to be reasonable and change your ending. How many of you are thankful in this moment that God is reasonable? That God is considerate, that he is not obstinate and stubborn and says, you blew it, I'm done, I I made up my mind about everything already. See, to be reasonable means two things. First, it means someone is willing to consider. To be reasonable, to be willing to yield, all these things, it means you're willing to consider, you're willing to listen. You know some people not willing to listen? Right off the bat, very first thing about being willing to yield, you're willing to listen. Actually listen. You're willing to look, you're willing to examine, to consider, to actually genuinely consider. Second, it means that the person is willing to then reconsider, to adjust their response accordingly. When it comes to God, he is willing to consider all the factors of our situation and then reconsider his response. 
It's the only way our prayers make any difference. God hears, he listens, he considers, and then he acts. He responds. He has not made up his mind. He is moved by our prayers. James tells us later on, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful. They affect much change. God is willing to yield to our prayers. Not only is God able to see the reasons for action in each situation, he sees them better than anybody. See, God is the most reasonable, he's the most reasonable being there is. You might think of yourself as reasonable. You can listen to reason. You're considerate. You're willing to take in all of the information. You're willing to listen. Guess what? Nobody does it better than God. Nobody is more reasonable. Nobody understands all the reasons like he does. He sees and knows the reasons for everything. The actions of God make the most sense. Everything he does is reasonable. Everything he does comes with reasons behind it. Why are you the way you are? Why did you wear that? Well, I got a reason. Yeah, God's got reasons for all of it. He sees he's the most reasonable. He is the most considerate, which means when we go to God, we can have confidence that he sees all the reasons. That God is never unreasonable with you. That there's never a moment where something is happening in your life. God, what are you doing? Do you not understand? God says, oh, I'm willing to consider. But let me tell you, I see all the reasons. I know everything that's going on. And I will not violate my goodness and my justice and my truth and my love. This is who I am. I bring it all to the table. I'm willing to consider, yes. And I'm willing to reconsider. God is the most reasonable person. He's the most willing to yield. Nobody is more willing to yield than God because he's more aware of all the reasons for everything. So if God is willing to yield to others, James tells us that God will then prompt us with wisdom from above to be willing to yield to others too. And sometimes it's hard to be reasonable with unreasonable people. <laughs> sometimes people are unreasonable, yes? Do you, do you know people that are unreasonable that you go, man, they just won't listen to reason? King Saul wanted to kill King David, or David, right, before he was king. He wanted to kill David, right? He, he had no reason. He was just threatened. But did David intend any harm to Saul? If you know the story, David would never have touched a hair on Saul. He wouldn't have done anything to him. Saul would have been just fine. But Saul kept going. And it says Jonathan, his son, tried to reason with him. He was like, Dad, what are you doing? Why are you trying to kill him? There's no reason for this. Stop it. He was being unreasonable. Life is full of unreasonable, and you can't tell him anything. You've tried. You've tried to reason with people. You've tried to sit down with people and say, like, would you listen? Would you consider this? I want to just, I just want to un- communicate this to you. Do you not understand this? You're being unreasonable. Anybody ever faced situations like that? And you're like, man, this is so frustrating. Sometimes we are the unreasonable ones. Ouch. It's so quiet in here. Man, I know it's August and Sunday morning's early, but man, it's quiet. Like, even like, yeah, that's good, Pastor. Like, yep, you're right. Yep, it could be me. See, we aren't even willing to consider other people's perspective sometimes. We have no, no interest whatsoever. We don't, we don't even want other people to be right. There's, just, there's a pride in us that, like, I'm not willing to listen to them because I don't want them to be right. Or we're afraid of what it might cost us. If I listen to them, maybe, maybe you know, I have to change and I don't feel like changing. Or maybe we've accepted and assumed something about them that they can't be right. You know, we've, we just, again, we don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be tricked. James couldn't be clearer. Being unreasonable, being stubborn, being hard-headed, saying, I'm unwilling to listen and consider to others. He said, listen, you can do that. That's just called foolish living. Because the wisdom from above says it's, it's going to be considerate, willing to yield to others. That's the wisdom of God. In every circumstance, in every situation, the wise thing to do is to listen, to consider. Doesn't mean you have to believe everything, but it means we listen. James couldn't be clearer. There's wisdom in being willing to consider. Because if God is that way, then we can be too. If God is willing to listen to everybody, willing to consider all of it, we can be too. And here's why this matters. 
if God is unreasonable, then nothing we do matters. If God is unreasonable, not a single thing that we do in this life makes any difference. But if God is reasonable, then everything we do matters. Do you see that? If God is reasonable, if God truly considers all things, then everything we do makes a difference. It all counts. You see what hangs in the balance here. And if we are unreasonable, if we're unreasonable, then nothing anybody else does makes any difference. We're telling people it doesn't matter what you do. I'm unreasonable. I'm holding the flag up. I'm an unreasonable person. You can say whatever you'd like. You can do whatever you'd like. Won't make a difference. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. I am stuck in my ways. You can't change me. I'm unreasonable. Proud of it. We laugh. There's so many people that live like this. This is why it matters. But if we are reasonable, then here's what happens. If we choose to be reasonable, to be considered, to be willing to yield, to willing to consider, if we take that posture, then we give others room to be right. We give ourselves an opportunity to learn. And at the end of the day, we treat them with honor and dignity and respect, saying, I'm willing to honor your humanity, the image of God in you, by saying, there's a chance you may know something I don't. Willing to consider. It's dignifying. Sometimes the people of faith, people who say they follow Jesus, who call themselves Christians, they can be some of the most arrogant people on the planet. We think we know it all. We have nothing to learn. I'm telling you, social media, you go on social media, I can tell you, right? We know it. People, you can't tell them anything. They know everything. They're just here to educate everybody else. They have figured out the code, the mystery of life. Come to me, and I will teach you my ways, right? Some of the most unreasonable people in the world are people of faith, and it makes no sense. Because it's foolish. It's not the wisdom from above. That's not how God is. Do you know who Apollos was? Not Apollo Creed, but Apollos from the, from the New Testament. He was one of the most powerful preachers in the early church. He's amazing. He was a huge influence. We don't hear about him a lot in church, but he was very educated. Uh, I mean, one of the brilliant mind. He was a, he was a powerful person. I personally think that he was the author of Hebrews. Uh, I, did a, I wrote a paper on this in college. If you'd like to read it, it's about 50 pages um, on why I think, but that was like 25 years ago, and uh, it's probably totally ridiculous. But I really do think that Apollos, his, his qualifications, his language, the things that we know of him, make him a good candidate to have written the book of Hebrews because we don't know who wrote that one. Um, but it's one of the most powerful books. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's awesome. We don't know who, but this is what we know about Apollo. So there's this fascinating passage in Acts concerning him. And we read this in Acts chapter 18, verse 24, and it says this. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker, right, who knew the scriptures well, so smart guy, he had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. Alexandria was this great city, I mean, renowned for their in, you know, knowledge and just wisdom. It says he had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. Right? So this was a guy who was in ministry. He was doing it. He was killing it. Everybody knew he was great. He was just, man, he was somebody to be revered in the early church. It says, however, he knew only about John's baptism. Verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila, it's a couple, husband and wife, heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. This is a guy who is really like at the pinnacle of the church, leading the way. And he was willing to let a couple in another city who you have never heard of, but who knew more than he did, teach him. He was willing to listen, to yield, to be taught about God more accurately. Did he know about God? He was teaching about God. They called him eloquent. He knew the word of God well. He knew much about it. He was far along in his years, but he was willing 
to be teachable, to learn and to grow. See, wisdom is knowing that you don't know everything. That the older you get, the more you understand how teachable we need to be to continue to be. Wisdom says there's room to keep learning. It's not being afraid of being misled. I'm not afraid that somebody's going to, you know, I'm willing to consider it. Like, are we all just like dumb sheep? Like, somebody's going to teach us something that's completely wrong, and we're going to go, okay. You said so. Okay. Right? That that's our reason not to listen to other people and not to consider other people is because we're afraid that they're going to mislead us. I've got great news for you. If that's you and you genuinely have concern about that, there's something called the Spirit of God that lives inside you and gives you discernment. It lets you know, is this right or wrong? Is this from God? It's a compass God puts inside you in the form of the Holy Spirit so you don't have to be afraid to consider other people's perspectives. You don't have to walk into this world with fear that somebody's going to contaminate or corrupt you. You walk into the world willing to consider because there's wisdom in it. And when people see your posture, it changes something in them. They go, you're not being unreasonable. You're actually pretty reasonable. You're willing to listen, which means I should probably listen to you because you are listening to me. Nobody wants to listen to somebody who's unreasonable. We just shut them off. But if someone goes, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. We go, man, this person's, they can, they can hear things. I'd like to hear some things from them. They sound like a wise person. The more you know, the more you know how little you know. We don't have to put truth on the table. That doesn't change. Who God is doesn't change. But there's always room to yield to others. There's the wisdom from above. So what? So what? Two questions here. The question is this. Are you honestly willing to yield to God? Do you struggle to yield to God or are you willing to yield to God? Hmm. Hmm. Think about this. The creator of the universe is willing to yield to you. Who are we to say, I'm not going to yield back? I'll say that again. Think about it. The creator of the universe says, I am willing to yield to you. I won't. We talked about this last week. He's gentle. He doesn't force himself. Right? God doesn't make you do anything. He says he's willing to consider. He's willing to be reasonable. So if God is willing to listen to us, who certainly has no business listening to us, how could we ever say, God, I'm not willing to listen back? not willing to yield to you. See, there's this idea here, and it's a biblical idea. It's a God idea. It's called mutual submission. It's best represented in a marriage. Often when I talk with young couples, it's not, you know, who gets to decide, who, who's in authority here. It's the wrong question. It's not about who's in power. The question is, are you both willing to submit to each other? Mutual submission. We submit to God, and He in love considers us. It's like driving down a road. You, you've been on a road, and you see like a narrow bridge. And on one side of the bridge, there's a yield sign. So you, you stop, you let a car come, and, and then you go. And then on your return journey, you notice that there's a yield sign on the other side of the bridge coming back. You're like, what? They both, they both yield. Both assume the posture of consideration. My driver's ed teacher, I will never forget, Mr. Shirk, Lawrence High School. He said, <laughs> he said, hey, tell me in this situation, you know, big guy, tell me in this situation, who has the right of way? This person has the right of way, this person has the right of way. He'd go, nope. Nobody has the right of way. The question is just who yields to who. And in that moment, I was like, we are not in driver's ed anymore, people. These are life lessons. It's not about who has the right of way. It's about who yields to who. The wisdom from above, willing to yield at all times to others. 
consider it. God promises. Here's, how it, here's, here's what it looks like biblically. We go, oh, if you delight yourself in the Lord in me, God says, I will give you the desires of your heart. You yield to me, and I yield to you. See, it's beautiful if we understand it. If we're willing to trust God for it. Are you willing to yield to God, to really say, God, I'm actually going to give you permission to say whatever you want to say to me? Because sometimes we say, God, I will let you speak into this and this and this and this, but I don't want to hear all of this. I don't even want to listen about these things because I don't know what you're going to say and I don't know if I want to hear what you're going to say about this. I might disagree. I might not want to embrace that. I might be concerned about if you say that and then I have to do something with that, what others might respond to me about. If I, if I go that way and they look at me different because I'm, God, I don't even want to open those doors. The creator of the universe is willing to yield to you. Are you willing to yield back to him? There's wisdom in yielding. One of the best ways to physically put this in practice, we talk about it often in the church, it's baptism. Water baptism. It's a symbol of saying, God, I yield. Just, I got to yield to you. I acknowledge this is who you are. I declare publicly that I believe in you, and God declares back to you, I love you. I love you. When, when Jesus was baptized, it says he, he, got down, he got in the water, and it says he was baptized. He acknowledged. He was submitting. He was yielding to the will of the Father for him. And when he was coming up, they said a voice from heaven spoke down and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. God honored him back. There's mutual submission. We celebrate God has changed the way he sees us, no longer dead to sin, but alive in him. So next week, we're going to do a baptism. There's actually water in there right now. We're going to drain it. I don't know. I guess they had a baptism service here yesterday. So we're going to drain it. There will be fresh water. But we're going to do a baptism service next week. If you haven't been baptized, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? We'll have a meeting Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Have it at the office. If you can't make it, you can Zoom in. If you're watching online, you're, please sign up. Take out your connection card right now. Say, hey, sign me up, baptism. Or, I'm interested. I'm willing to come to the meeting. Listen, baptism is not a have to. You do not have to be baptized. It's not like you're not, you're not a child of God until you're baptized. Nothing like that. Baptism is a get to. We get to honor God. We get to yield to him. We get to publicly say, God, I'm, I'm serious about this. It's time for me to, to just say, yes, I'm in. That's it. It's, a, it's an awesome thing. It's so amazing. It says when, when we're during baptism, like heaven's having a party. It's amazing. And we're going to do it next week during our service, at the end of our service. So if you want to get baptized, we're going to do more of these now that we're back in this building. Hopefully we'll do them regularly. But don't wait. Are you willing to yield? This is the time. Put your faith in action now. We'll get you information. Sign up. Second question. Is there someone you have been unreasonable with? Maybe you need to ask their forgiveness. Take them out for coffee and actually listen. Consider, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's somebody else in your life and you go, I have not really ever been, like in this moment, I don't want to hear what they have to say. I don't, I don't want to listen to them, I don't care. I don't consider their perspective. God says the wisdom from above is willing to yield to others. Learn about them. Can I tell you, I've been sitting down with some people in our community who likely do not agree with how I live my life. <laughs> kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a flip because for the church, we're the ones that do the judging. We're the ones that don't like the way other people live their lives. But there are people that probably don't like the way I live my life. And I've been, I've been having coffee with people in our community. And some of them, I don't know what they think about me. Some of them, you know, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. And you know what's happening? I'm listening and they're listening to me and we're mutually yielding, having conversations. And can I tell you, 
we're growing. I'm learning. God is stretching and revealing things to me. See, truth is truth. But there is room for reasoning together. It's amazing what we can learn when we really listen to understand. And this is important here because sometimes we just listen to get to tell our side of the story. And that's not listening. There's so many things about active listening and good listening. I was watching a YouTube video about a few weeks ago about a guy talking about really, really listening. And it's, a, it's one of those things we know. We know when we're really listening or when we're not. Can I encourage you that there's some wisdom? God says the wisest thing you can do is really consider somebody else's perspective. There's wisdom in it. That there's love in it. There's goodness in it. And we don't have to fear being deceived. The Holy Spirit in us. Remember, it's a good filter. Make sure that only the good stuff gets in. But as the people of God, we should be the most reasonable people on the planet. Nobody should be more willing to listen, willing to consider than the people of God. Yet sometimes our reputation is the complete opposite. We're doing this, na, 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 when everybody else is talking because we don't want to hear it. Because we've already got our mind made up. It's foolish. It's hurtful. It's disrespectful. It's dishonoring. It's not what God does. He is reasonable with us. And his wisdom prompts us to be reasonable with others. See, we know every yes to something is a no to something else. Right? Every time you say yes to something, it's a no to something else. We make decisions all the time. Every yes to being reasonable is a no to being unreasonable. Every yes to being reasonable is a no to foolishness. It's a yes to wisdom. I'm going to close with this exhortation from God through the prophet Isaiah. Would you close your eyes as, as, we, as I read this? It's the words of our Lord through the prophet, and he says this, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat from the good of the land. Lord, teach us to be wise. Lord, teach us to say yes to being reasonable, willing to yield, considerate. Lord, if we have been foolish, hard-hearted, unreasonable, stubborn, stuck in our ways, not willing to listen, not willing to consider anyone else's perspective, God, plain and simple, forgive us. If that's you right now, just where you are, do business between you and God. Just say, God, forgive me. Right where you are. He sees you. He doesn't need any, any show. God can work in your life right where you are. Just say, God, forgive me for being unreasonable. No need to justify it. God knows the reasons. <laughs> we can say, yeah, I, I, I was trying to do the right thing, God. I was trying to hold the line. I was trying to do what I thought was right. And listen, there is now no condemnation in God. There's grace. There's forgiveness. But once we realize and learn something, we need to go and be different. So we come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, that was not right. If you've been unreasonable right now, just say, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive us for the times where we have not represented you well, where we've not walked in wisdom, where we've been foolish. Teach us to listen. Lord, not with fear, but with love. Lord, and would you put someone on our heart that we should be listening to this week? Lord, who, do you, who are you sending us to to show them consideration? To just listen. To dignify and honor them as people. Be willing to listen. Won't change what's true. But 
may change us. That we would adopt a posture of willingness to consider, to reconsider. May we be the most reasonable people around. I thank you. We commit ourselves to you, God. Lord, we offer ourselves to you. How good you are. Lord, we have so many reasons to worship you and to praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.